I can't help us. Okay. Um, this site here, uh, what I'm going to do, okay, there's a whole lot of, it's, a, there's, it's way too big a subject to give uh, in one lecture uh, all about printing, even, even selected subjects for, uh, for this year. But I thought to, to pull out a few things that might be helpful to the, to the membership and I, I'll present them. If, if, if everybody's uh, starting to fall asleep, just uh, yell and I'll go on to the next subject. This one, <laughs> this site here is HP's site on, on comparative printers, which has, I think does a fairly decent job of comparing all the, the printers. So um, I would suggest... Uh, if you're inter if you want to get an idea, you know, there's, al there's always people asking me what printer should I buy, and uh, this thing mentions how you figure that out. Okay, what to look for, what to do, all all, all the items where you you consider what quality you're dealing with, and all the rest of that. So that's this site here. Um, oh, let me go back. Let's go back. Wink. Come on, hit it when it won't talk to me. There, okay. Um, I posted this document with the, the board. I hope uh, um, we can get it on, uh, post it someplace. Anybody who wants to follow up on the uh, research here can uh, just click on one of these leads here. And here's the, here's the one I kind of like. This is the history of printing and, and, and of HP. Um, there's a lot of important stuff, and HP had a lot to do with uh, printing and computing. When they switched <laughs> over from an engineering company, an electronics company, into a uh, computer company, and a, uh, they started, and, and they mentioned each and every one of their uh, advances. And, and if, if you want to, you can go to their history site, and this is only one small excerpt from their history site. They have a detailed history of the company and, and of every one of their important products. You see, they're, they're saying in the 1990s when the first of the serious desk jets came out. By the way, that's where I discovered that, that, um, that the case on that is ABS. It, it, it used to outlet, the machine would break down before ever the, the case broke. And it was always able to, you were always able to shine it up. And today's modern printers don't have that. Kevin, what does ABS stand for? Uh, the resin that the plastic is made out of. It's high, it's high impact plastic with a, a, some sort of a special uh, additive they put in it to make the surface of the plastic shine up nice. HP really cared about that product and it was like their first and it was pretty. Uh, nowadays you're going to find that a lot of cases on these real cheap under 100 buck things are mostly styrene because of the cost of manufacture. It's cheap. But styrene breaks easy. It doesn't stand up to, to impacts. It doesn't stand up to uh, scratches and stuff like that. So you're going to find out that a styrene case will usually be very carefully packed with a with a, a, a wrapper so it doesn't get scratched before the customer gets it. Okay. Here's one. Uh, HP actually had a hand in in uh, molecular logic gates. They, they worked out the ink. Wait a minute, where... Um, <laughs> they didn't... Let's see, color signs, the fundamental, blah, blah, blah. Let me just see if I can find something. Okay, so this site here, also listed, you don't have to, to copy it down, but will give you a start into history of printing. If you're interested. Okay. Uh, here's a little something that they're doing now. That's, <laughs> that's HP's show-off 
$35,000 uh, 3D printer. <laughs> and not likely you'll be buying one of these for your home anytime soon. Um, but you may be affected by it because products are now going to start to be being developed on this. Things are going to pop up. There will probably be, uh, if there isn't already, there will be pretty soon some place in Brooklyn where they've got a whole bunch of these printers and you send them an order and a file and they, pr and they print it out for you. Uh, and in a couple of days, for a couple of hundred bucks, a model can be built. Um, any, any of our old engineers will tell you how many thousands of dollars it, co it used to cost to get a handmade model made by a model maker. So a lot of these things now you're hearing a lot about startup companies coming out with a product and getting a model made to, to start their business. And this machine is going to revolutionize what that, the time it takes and the cost it takes to do that. Uh, oh, and I might as well go over a little bit, a tiny bit of the technology without getting too geeky. What it essentially does is it, if you can imagine a, 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 a dot matrix, um, um, what inkjet printer, printing on a pa piece of paper, it squirts the ink on the paper. What this machine does is it squirts binder onto a, uh, onto a, a a, a surface of powder and it keeps putting layers of powder and then squirts some binder and then puts more layers of, eventually when they shake off all the powder you wind up with a 3d object created by uh, created from powdered plastic and, and binder they then figured out how you could take that and use it as a sort of a lost wax um, a mold and pour metal into it and have a metal object uh, made very quickly so HP is just getting big on their uh, bragging the heck out of their come on uh, out of their uh, getting their um, let me try again HP has got this as a positive and additive process okay which goes a lot faster because you're only putting on in the old days you used to have to get a large block of metal take, uh, make a program turret lathe and it would cut away all the metal you didn't want and you would wind up with a much more expensive model that took a lot longer to build and cost a lot more money to make. This is a, a major a decrease in the cost of model making. Okay, that's that. Are there, are there any major competitors in this particular area? A few, but HP seems to be ahead of them all. Um, there, there were quite a number of companies that uh, started off in a small way way ahead of this. Um, ten years ago, you could go to a couple of companies on Long Island and have an additive metal part produced by, uh, by binding together metal particles uh, in, a, in the same kind of layering process and then th just throwing the thing into an oven and melting the metal down and it would stick and you would have a metal part. Um, they used it to make all sorts of things, but the company, um, they, they, they primarily sold their service, not the, not the machine. Uh, and the machine was uh, more, even more expensive than the $35,000 uh, HP unit. I'm sure HP is going to try and cut the price on this, uh, and pretty quickly. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, if you want to follow up on that, HP is just waiting to brag at you. So you can go to any one of them. They even have videos. You can uh, look and show them how they're, they're producing stuff. And uh, wait a minute. Let me just get their article to show a bit. So the big thing about this is you're probably not going to buy one of these. But this may affect you if you're, uh, if you're having anything to do with company startups or anything like that. And this is, uh, HP is probably, they've probably taken over the idea that that company in Long Island had of using powdered metal and sticking it together. <laughs> um, they've done a lot of careful chemical work and, and physics work to get all of this stuff to work. Oh, all of this technology is based on HP's 
uh, big invention that they came up with in the 90s. I believe the last time I did the, uh, the printer show off, I showed a little picture of an integrated circuit that was actually a printhead. When HP built it, it's about an inch long, and you can combine them together to make as large a printhead as you want it. Uh, this, well, this technology is partially based on that same stuff. Okay, let's go back. Um, where's the back button? Boink. Okay. Um, well, if you, I, I don't know. Is anybody? Is, is there any big interest in the uh, metal printer? Okay, we'll get on to the next thing. Okay. No, that's not what I wanted. Oh, I showed you the histories. Okay, so the histories have already been looked at. Um, the 3D metal printer. Okay. Uh -huh, let's try that one. Okay. Dave, oh, here's the, uh, wait a minute, here's a good look at the actual technology here. There's the powder bed. See it? The, the, the spray head goes over the top of that powder and, sp and sprays binder down into it. And they're, what they're pulling out of that, that's the actual part that they're pulling out of the powder. Okay, that's enough of that. If you want to follow up on that, 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 that lead is here as well. Okay, so these are the latest and greatest of HP's show-off products, and we'll be getting into a couple of other manufacturers in a minute. Let's go back. Uh -huh. ah. Oh, that's what it looks like from a distance with the whole machine. The, the printer part is that middle bit, and the powder uh, bins are over there on on the on the right. And what, what is it about four or five feet five feet high? Uh, five yeah, feet? it's about five feet high and about eight feet wide, and about uh, almost thirty inches deep. Uh, it's a monster. Um, as I said, they're primarily targeting uh, startup manufacturers or possibility of a, a, a print center where a company de uh, dedicates uh, several of these machines to printing orders for uh, small startup companies to get them their models. That's probably the way it's going to work as a sort of a, a service desk. What I like about equipment like this is it's so damn expensive they can't throw it away. Uh, they have to fix it. Uh, and they can't quibble too much about how much they're spending either. Okay, why are we not getting back? I got... Uh-oh. All right, well, we'll reopen. Come here, you. Okay. Okay, now let's see. We're a little presentation here. There's lots more history. H HP did something that almost none of the other companies ever did. For some reason or other, the engineers liked it, the idea of writing their history down. So they have extensive documentation of how they developed every product. And, and their entire history of the company on an almost day-to-day -day basis in this huge uh, database of history. So if anybody's interested in how they did anything, uh, I'm, I've been interested in that a few times. It might be useful for people who want to do a bit, you know, to, to, uh, to try a startup business. Okay. How did you let a packer come together? Say what? Um, that's in there, that's in there, the, the, uh, the original, uh, made in a garage, they, two engineers that happened to know one another, uh, from contacts, 
and they started their company in their own uh, garage in in uh, Packard's garage and it, it's another one of those companies that they actually still have the garage <laughs> where they built their first uh, oscillator that was their first product an audio oscillator which is useful in radio business um, but their big the, the, the thing we're interested in is, is a time when they cut a deal with Canon and became the American engineering arm of a, of a double-ended company. The Canon's, Canon was producing the uh, laser engine and HP wrote the software and, and perfected the engineering and dealt with all the service end in this country. They made an ideal company and penetrated the printer market on the east coast of, of this country almost exclusively uh, to the point where they became the company, the go-to company for printing. Then they cut a deal with Adobe uh, to pull them away from, uh, uh, from Apple. Well, at one point, the Apple laser printer was the first and best uh, home, uh, small office or home use uh, laser printer. It was the Cadillac of printing. And everybody else tried to catch up. HP's big secret was they made a product that cost about just a little over half uh, what the Apple cost, but it could turn out, a pro it could turn out printing the same quality. So that was how they, they did their business. And they, and they, they didn't hesitate to, to uh, buy into uh, Adobe to get them away from Apple. Uh, let's see, inkjet. Oh, this, okay. How do inkjets work? Uh, now, this is the, the technology of it. Um, there. Um, the original inkjet things was a single line of droplets being deflected. That was IBM's idea. It cost a fortune. It was a dumb idea. Um, it, it, well, it, it was, it was a beautiful engineering, but way too complicated and expensive. Now here is what they're doing now. These are the two inkjet schemes that they used. Heat, which is the so-called bubble jet, and piezoelectricity, that little green spot in the back represents a piezo crystal, which is electrically stimulated and causes the metal of diaphragm to bend. Uh, it turns out that uh, the heat version is cheaper, but the piezo is much, much more accurate for better printing. And people like Ebsen and, and Ebsen uh, were the ones that pioneered the piezo work. Canon, being a photographic company, uh, they had the better, uh, they had the inside track on image, image reproduction and standardization of color. So that's what they, that's what they brought to the table. Eventually, every, all the companies started copying whatever the other company had. But it was, the, the modern printer is a, is a, an, a spontaneous or um, a coming together of, of multiple companies that each had uh, an area of expertise that was complementary with the others. In some cases, it was actually by contract, but in other cases, they just happened to rub together enough until they started to turn out a decent product. Ah. Now, these are the familiar print heads everybody's been looking at uh, when, and, and cursing at because they cost so much. Uh, back in the day, when one of these things is just a, a, an ink container, the white thing, but the other two actually have the heads built onto them so that when you replace the ink supply, you also replace the print heads. HP sort of pioneered uh, that head, which is actually made by the same kind of techniques, same kind of printing techniques that ICs are made with. The heads, the, the heads of the printer are actually printed. Uh, 
Um, I, this article, by the way, that is worth a read if anybody's really interested in printing. Um, and <laughs> here's the, the headache with uh, um, all of the, I guess uh, over the time, all of the printer users found out about every, every dumb idea that, that, that didn't quite pan out. In, in the printing biz, especially with inkjets, because they became the, the system of choice for the small home user and, and small business user. With the laser systems being more in, in the, the middle size to large business user. Anyway, so this article is well worth looking at if you want to get some real good information on how printers work. Okay. Let's get another. Ah, you can go. Just out of curiosity, what does that, mach that additive machine uh, cost? Uh, you mean the HP? Uh, I think the baseline, uh, it, it's, they're, they're pushing to make it come down. But the last time I looked, it was like 35 grand. Um, with a baseline machine, there were lots more things you could add on. <laughs> um, you could add extra uh, powder units, okay? So that if you were using the machine and you wanted to develop the powder unit, meaning get the part out of it, yeah. Okay, you could roll up a f another powder unit and have the machine continue making something else while you were busy get uh, recovering the parts out of the old the other. So, by uh, the thirty-five grand only covered the machine with one powder unit. <laughs> if you had, if you put in a second or third of them, it started increasing the price of the machine pretty quick. When they developed this, were they targeting? One particular, I mean, it's obviously adaptable to so many things, but were they targeting one particular industry? Model building. They, they, no, they, they were, uh, HP started out as, a, as an engineering firm. They built printers originally for their own use. And uh, people like Tektronix uh, that, that built the, the first of the color printers, they originally built those uh, things for use as an engineering tool. Okay, the engineers wanted color, dis uh, you know, color blueprints and, and color diagrams, and they wanted to print them. So it was uh, it, the idea that you could want a, a color diagram made for some engineering purpose or a color blueprint, and it would take you more than a week to make it and take the, the employer, uh, employment of uh, three or four different draftsmen and cost uh, several hundred dollars per, uh, per sheet. Um, was reduced from that to a few hours waiting and, and uh, maybe, a, uh, maybe about 10 or 20 dollars for, for the product. So they did a hell of a nice job of speeding it up and, co and cutting the cost of doing these large-scale development printouts. And they are still in use. There, there are still large-scale printers that make blueprints, do renderings, do uh, graphics for... One of the big improvements for HP's bottom line was that their large-scale graphic printer, which was thought to only be a use, of use to an engineering outfit to, to produce diagrams and blueprints, has gotten like a second life where it, it's used to produce uh, advertisement uh, graphic. So that a lot of the signs you're looking at that are not written, you know, that are not uh, electronic, that are still made on paper, are being printed out by these large-scale printers in strips eight feet wide, which makes the, where uh, a hand-painted sign could cost ten or twenty thousand dollars to put up, even a small one, uh, you could cut that cost by a factor. If you printed it out and had it and had the stuff uh, hung by a, a, a single technician, so that it revolutionized. Do you remember wrapped buses? When the buses used to come wrapped in those uh, plastic, those are printed on a printer on the inside of that thing, and then the shrink wrap material is shrunk onto the bus, and it carries the image right onto uh, a surface. 
It was the most amazing idea. But essentially, almost every kind of uh, advertisement sign you're going to see out is done that way. It's printed on the inside of shrinkable plastic material that is then shrunk onto the 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 uh, sign, however big it is, is made in strips, and they put them up and shrink them into place. That made it possible to make sign, to rebuild signs at about, as I said, at a factor less in cost, and they last longer in, in, in use. So it's like a major revolution for the advertisement biz and outside displays of all sorts. Okay, let's go back here. Come back here, you. Uh -huh. Boom. Uh, let's take... Let's not that one. Let's see what we get here. Ah. Chrome. Boink. Okay. Okay. Ah. This is a, uh, another view from the point of view of business and the effect that these high-speed printers are having on just about, it's hard, to, it's hard to quite grasp the way that the, the notion of printing stuff has, you know, people think, well, paper's going away, printing must be disappearing. No, it's printing has gone into other areas, as I said, into the area of commercial graphics, into the area of uh, electronics. Almost everything in electronics is printed. The circuit boards are printed. The ICs are printed. Some of the <laughs> some of the components are printed. They're all being printed by automated machines that are printing them out. So that uh, the printer isn't going away. It's going into other fields. Anyway, it's having a big effect on the way business gets done in this country. Also, as I said, each time they come up with one of these printing processes, usually it cuts the cost of manufacture by a factor or more and speeds up the, the time of production by a factor or more. So almost everything is printed. Uh -huh. uh, this is all in business speak. Uh, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not as big on business talk as that. Let's see if we can go back here. Okay. Technologies and printing. Uh, boink. Let's see. Uh, this is another word you may... You, anybody who, who likes to talk business is going to hear more and more about emerging technologies. Um, that's... Emergence is, is a concept that was brought up by, um, it came from, uh, from science and science fiction and has now become a business word. So <laughs> it's talking about how the phenomena, how, how various types of information come together to produce a business which appears to come up of its own accord, to emerge. In, Well, let's see. Oh, uh, there's the full report if anybody's interested in actually digging into this and uh, seeing how some business types have figured out how uh, the business of printing has changed the way business gets done. <clears throat> and there's uh, the plug for the company that prepared the report. Okay. Let's get in there. Uh huh. Hmm. Let's see. Mega trends. <laughs> that one. Boink. <laughs> this is another one, sort of more historically oriented. Um, the, all of these reports 
uh, are interestingly enough, some of them are, are, they come from the point of view of business, some of them come from the point of view of history, some from technology. So you're going to see all sorts of strange approaches to the, the same thing. It may sound like totally different, but it, it, they're talking about the same thing, believe it or not. Uh, Ah, here we go. Let's see what. Ah, fui on you. Ah. This may, that might have been an artifact of the fact that uh, um, that I'm not in the same website while it's being done. Okay. Hmm. Maybe that'll actually work. Let's try it. Can't hurt, might help. Well, I'll snap it up. We don't need all this crap. Yeah. Well, let's see if we can boost this. The My, my background in industrial design, industrial design is, is down to the hip with mass production, as the two are married. Um, it does... Well, mass things. production doesn't so suck, huh? <laughs> okay. Hey! Back in time, mass produced, obviously they were made one thing per person by a skilled artisan. And so each artifact that came from that was unique to that person and it was an, an individualized instantiation. Now, of course, that gave way to mass production. And a lot of benefits came from that. All of a sudden, instead of these things being untested, because you can't test individualized instantiations, you had things that were testable, and you, you had things that were reliable and predictable, and all of a sudden, you had cheap, because if you're making a zillion of something, you can amortize the cost of that zillion things over all the, uh, the upfront cost gets split over all the purchases. So you get all these great benefits that come from that. But um, here's, here's some of the stuff we've done, Apple and who, PDAs and cell graphics and right. all these guys. This is the kind of stuff they do. It's like, um, there's more Apple stuff, I guess. All this stuff it, is uh, printed. It allows everything to get cheap and, and pretty good. The downside, though, is that they're, they're, you know, it comes at a price. And so, has anyone seen Fight Club? This is that scene where Ed Norton kind of <clears throat> wakes up and looks around and realizes that his life is just concoction of crap that he bought at Ikea. And that it wasn't all that different from anyone else who bought other crap at Ikea because everybody's bought the same crap at Ikea. And he had an existential crisis in the close Los Angeles. And, you know, be that good or bad, that's not my call to make. But um, that's Northern California perspective, by the way. So instead of, you know, blowing up. Oh, this is going to take a while. Um, um, here's this another pitfall one in that production is that if you have things that are. Okay, vote. Do you want to see the whole thing out, or do you want to... I didn't think so. Okay. Anybody who wants to come by, the, the lead is there. You can go and watch the whole video at your, at your leisure. Um, this guy has uh, got a rather slow lecture style. I had hoped he would deliver quick. But he'll actually explain the whole of history from the, the start of movable print up to modern <laughs> times. But essentially, it's standardization. He's right. Standardization, generalization, uh, that allow, and, and the very nature of printing is that, standardization. By agreeing on, on standard uh, type and moving the thing, you know, so that an A is always an A, and you can always put one in. Oh, damn, it's starting up again. Get away. Um, that printing was, printing is the ultimate result of years of standardization and mass production. We now have a mass production machine. That's what the printer really is now. Oh, this uh, one quick side look. Has everybody gone to one of one of those book printers and actually looked at the book printing machine, the book on demand machine, printing books out. To, there's a machine uh, roughly about the size of that desk um, that you, you, put the, you put the script in and a book comes out. 
it, <laughs> it prints, uh, you put the script in and, and the instructions on how to format it, you know, uh, you know, where to put the pictures and all the rest of that, and the thing prints, binds, and produces a book. All one, on, one at a time, on demand. So <laughs> there, that's, that's really getting into automation, but that, I think that's something of, uh, you know, it's an oddity. I, it may find some specific uh, profit-making or real business applications, but for most people it's just, gee, wow, I had this machine print me a book right on the spot. Uh, well, <laughs> To print them out on, on the spot. The trick is, it's, I don't know, the, the, the machine seems way too kludgy and too slow to be printing like millions of books. Uh, so, on the other hand, the web printer on Long Island prints an entire web of paper in a matter of minutes. Okay, that's a mile, about a mile and a half of paper. Uh, it can print out a, apparently the new IPO offers are offered as a, a bound book. Okay, I, I guess there's so much money in it. They 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 offer when you're uh, offered an IPO prospectus, it's going to be a book. Okay, so they print these things on short notice and, and deliver them to potential buyers into into IPO stuff. And uh, so they found one little niche for printing uh, on demand to print IPO offers. And uh, apparently, that a, a large chunk of web printing, web printing's uh, uh, business is printing these IPO offers. Uh, so they found it as a, a, a what would you call it as a promotional device that people were impressed by getting a bound book as their <laughs> as their offer instead of just a piece of paper. Okay, let's see. I don't need this. I think this is empty. Yes, go away. Bang. Okay. Now, let's see. Oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of uh, um, excellent uh, videos to go with this <laughs> um, on, on, on related subjects, which we won't, won't have any time to go into. But if you, you follow the lead and you're interested in history, you may go wandering off into a lot of fun stuff. Uh, let's go back here. Oh, can we get the back button to work again? We get that lucky? Nah. Too easy. Oh, there we go. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. This is a little more down to earth for our needs. Um, this one is by, um, what the heck is that? I think this is by Cannon. Okay. Cannon's uh, point of view. Oh, by the way, as I said, because Cannon was the image expert, um, they, were, they, were, they were coming from the photography point of view. For them, a uh, printer was just a way to get a photograph made into a, a piece of a piece of paper. So they were the first to come up with black surrounds to make the colors pop and did a whole bunch of really original work on printing color images. That's their area of true expertise, which they contributed to the printing business, essentially. Now, uh, just about all the companies do that kind of stuff, but Canon has always been way ahead. And they've come along and discussed. This is actually, I think this ad is supplied by Canon, but they're comparing the various uh, printers that are currently available on the market. For those people who are saying, constantly bothering me with, uh, what kind of printer would you buy? <laughs> Here it's a list, okay? And it tells the strengths and weaknesses of each machine and, and what the target, where, where it's the best fit and all the rest of that. So, and it's been done for all the different major manufacturers. So, there you are. Um, this is your comparative print stuff. 
And as I said, they, 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 this particular report focuses on the small personal size printer, the kind you actually put in a home or in a small office. Oh, yeah, and then now we get to cutesy product, products. I, I don't know how much interest there is here on that, but um, there is a whole industry of handicrafts based on printouts. Um, uh, these art shirts were made by printing out the various images and then overlaying them onto cloth and ironing them in, <coughs> which is kind of a cool um, artistic trick. So uh, for those people interested in handicraft or, or craft art, uh, printing has become a, a, a major part of craft art. And there's, they, uh, the, printers, the printer manufacturers grokked it right away as a possible uh, way to increase sales. So they've cooperated in every way they could figure out. Um, they, they made special inks that can be transferred back and forth from pa and special kind of uh, vellum paper that you print the ink on, but it, do it stays, but it doesn't stick. So that when you iron it, it comes right off onto the next surface you want to transfer it onto, which is kind of cute. So that's all the printer companies have supplied special tools to make that art possible. And um, artists seem to have guzzled, you know, jumped right in and guzzled it up and turned out some nice products. Uh, Oh, here's another one. Uh, Epson was always the, their big, their big power was always their quality of production. And, but they, they showed in, in a very short order how neatly they could copy Canon's, uh, <laughs> uh, Canon's color, color picture technology. With a bla beautiful black surround on those colors, it pops, they, they hit you right in the eye. So ideas don't stay new for long. Everybody steals them. <laughs> now here's HP. And they're, they're sort of in the middle. HP was an engineering company. They thought in terms of engineering projects. So between Epson, which was a production company, Canon, which was a, an image company, and HP, which is sort of an, a combination engineering company, they all get their little contribution to the way printers work these days. Um, I think they're a historical phenomenon. When sometimes they co cooperated together deliberately, but other times they just had an effect on one another and traded ideas in the open air, air as it were. Uh. Uh. <laughs> then there, there are a number of really obscure printing methods. One of them is direct laser. IBM pioneered it, uh, um, and it, it uses specialized paper and writes directly on the paper with with a laser. So, but that requires a high energy laser, which costs a fortune. And there's a, um, what is it? The epilogue people are still uh, turning out. You may, since the epilogue unit is about three or $4,000, it's unlikely a lot of people are gonna put one in their house. But you may occasionally go to one of these meetup places where there's uh, crafts and, and doing stuff. If you uh, go to the Fat Cat Lab, uh, Fab Lab, you're going to find an epilogue laser printer there, printing away on wood or plastic or anything else that they put into it. <laughs> and it can do wood burning, fabric cutting, paper paper slicing, uh, and do all sorts of interesting stuff. And once again, it's a, a matter of uh, uh, all sorts of art and, and, uh, and t uh, what, what was it, craft types people that have 
grab these machines up and put them into service of some sort of craft business. This machine, too, uh, was a, a kind of a, a, a technical friend of mine. I, I used to like going ser to serve the laser uh, cutters because they were so darn expensive, nobody could think about getting rid of them. They had to fix them forever. Um, okay, that's the end of that. This, so that's, that's the website, and it's on the list. I've already put the list up. I hope it'll be published. Uh, I don't know who's going to do that. Um, and if anybody needs to, the list special, I've, I've got it with me now. Okay. Okay. How much time do we have left? Uh, somebody look at their wristwatch. Um, no, no, I want to, I want to see, first I want to find out how much time I have left because I don't want to over, overfly. How much? Oh boy, so we're near the end. Okay, um, we could watch, oh wait a minute, let me just show you the videos. Uh, you're going to have to go on, there's no time to watch these. I have hours of them, um, but, ah, uh, Okay. Now this is the one, oh come on, thank you. Uh, this is the one on, on how to deal with your printer on basic stuff. How to, you know, how to clean it, how to fix it, how to pull out the paper, how to put in the paper, all that kind of junk. So anybody who wants to find, it's, this is the, the, the time of the internet. No one has to go around and show you anything anymore. You can just look it up. Okay. Um, one quick look. I was playing this before they... Uh, <laughs> let's get right away into the material. And play it. So number one, check the printer for error messages. So there's a little display up on, on your printer. It's fairly basic. A lot of people know this, but if you can't print, First thing you do, walk over the printer and look. It might say it's out of paper, it might say it's out of toner, it might say there's a jam, that sort of thing. That's going to give you a really good idea of what's going on and why your printer is. Oh. Number two, reboot the printer. <laughs> um, one item, okay, uh, the display. One of the things you want to do when you get a printer is to download a copy of the tech manual for that printer. In the tech manual, you will have a, a list of, a, a, an extended list of what all those error messages really mean, which sometimes is not entirely obvious when you look at them, especially if they happen to be 22. Uh, and <laughs> you know, what is error 22? Okay, there's a list someplace which you can download based on your printer's make, model, and, and, and number. Uh, and it will tell you what error 22 is. Okay, so one of the things you want to get when you get a printer, or even before you get a printer, is a, a, a look at the manuals and documentation of that printer, which are usually posted on the internet. Okay, that's just that. Uh, the rest of this will be interesting, but we don't have time for it. <coughs> okay, let's get... Another one. Uh, yeah. Um, boink. Boing. Now that was the, the do, do stuff. Now here is the DIY stuff, my favorite. Uh, what it takes to actually make things happen. Sad fact with oh. Okay, rebooting is interesting with printers, but it has mixed results. Um, there's a lot of, uh, they, you know, they figure you, it, it's like chicken soup, might help, can hurt, um, but it can hurt. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize, if you have a big elaborate print job that took you a long time to get to send it to the printer, 
and it's ephemeral, meaning it went to the printer and now it's gone. Uh, if you turn off the printer, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> Um, unless the printer is saving a copy and if it is saving a copy then you want to use it and and make sure that when you're done with it you get rid of it because it goes with the printer and never goes away okay um, okay so that's that so there is a potential security risk you, it's nice to have this the printer save every job in case it, uh, something does go wrong but it is double-edged that job is saved, and somebody else may come along and reprint it. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of things that have snuck out the back door in a lot of American technology firms by that very method. Somebody came over to the printer in the off hours, put the thing in service mode, looked at the list of things to be that, that are saved, and printed them out, slipped them into their briefcase, and out the door it went. Okay, back to this. How much time now? Five. Okay. Um, okay, so you can see solve common printer. That's the last one. Um, DIY printer repair. There are a bunch of sites that specifically deal with fixing it yourself. And although the major manufacturers have not entirely come down on this, uh, I have a particular a personal political point of view. It's I believe they do have a duty to do so and that this, the, this country should legislate that and tell them that, you, that people who pay their good money for a product have a right to repair it and they have a right to repair it the way they want to repair it. Okay. Oh, this is interesting. Here's something I'm hoping people will get interested. Yes. Yes. Oh, get, get rid of this ad. Come on, ad. Go away. Get bad. Oh, boy. What's up, guys? I'm here with uh, Inkjet There's your app. In this video, I'm going to just salvage uh, electronic components from this. Uh, printer and uh, this is this printer is not uh, working and it's giving some error so cartridges are not good you wouldn't believe how many to, one, uh, one minute this printer and uh, so let's this let's speed things printer. up here okay so I came up with this idea to share okay all of these specific devices to, that are specific to me, uh, measuring and they if you were an, if, if you were charting an engineering project on your own and had to to build these from scratch they'd cost you a fortune but they're right there in a the printer as junk and people throw them on the street uh, you can have a bunch of these anytime you want right that whole print engine let's stop this for one second here just one second that whole print engine can be liberated from the box okay along with all of its stepping motors transport and everything else and a lot of times different factories would take a print engine out of a box like this and use it to print labels on uh, on merchandise directly onto the merchandise by printing direct you probably looked on bottles and jars and sound these little dot matrix printouts directly on the material that's how it's done they took one of these print engines out and just let it print directly onto the material anyway this guy will go through the details of how you can save motors and, and power supplies and all sorts of stuff out of old printers but it's a sin they, they, they literally plug, plug up our dumps and and kids could use all those spare parts to, to learn how to do engineering and uh, there's all this babble about oh but we'd love to have an engineering lab here but we can't afford all the junk that we need to do it well we can have some of it for free and save the environment while we're at it okay back to work
Okay, so that's that's this lot. Um, let's see when you got. F no, that's not it. Okay, come back. Come on. Okay, firmware, the last thing, and then we're done. Firmware is that thing everybody wishes to have. <laughs> Never. T I was on a printer service job at one point where the, the printer took nearly three days to fix. Uh, and it, the firmware just would not go in because the idiots who were writing it didn't know how to write firmware. Uh, so it, it's taken, it's taken, it was a rocky road. Uh, a, a, the idea that you would take a printer based on a certain amount of firmware and put the firmware in in a rush to get it to market and it might not be 100% correct. Okay, <laughs> so the printer would proceed to do something weird, and uh, then you have to put new firmware in to fix that. Okay, so this is one of those rocky roads that's come along, and, and um, a number of printer companies that had good reputations for turning out a decently engineered product stumbled their way into firmware uh, and really came out with mud on their face. So <laughs> there's no shortage of uh, punishment for that one. Um, now let's see. Yeah, okay. This is one of the things I like a little bit. This is GitHub, where a lot of people who write code put post the code and 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 support the product. Okay. Finally, there are a bunch of kids who are getting interested in rewriting the firmware on their their junk. Okay, uh, there is really no reason to fling everything into the junk pile. Uh, you might be able to write new code for it. The manufacturers would rather die and rot than admit that's doable. Okay, but they do it themselves all the time. <clears throat> okay, let's just get out of here. Let's get back into firmware. Ah, go away. Okay. Um, well, ah, there we are. Caught back up. Available homework. Firmware. Ah, okay. No, no transportation. Lazy. Ah, there we are. Uh, Amazon has uh, um, gotten in, uh, their their uh, business into <laughs> into dealing with this, and uh, this is literally what's going to change the world. Depending on whether or not companies get off the idea of disposable product and get into the idea of a standardized product that can be upgraded and updated and programmed and reprogrammed so that products don't, don't uh, go obsolete so quick. <coughs> well, planned obsolescence, but a, a solution for planned obsolescence that does not involve dumping the product. That everything will, will eventually outlive its usefulness. Okay, because the world changes, because the, the situation changes, the market changes, so forth. But there's got to be a way to recover stuff and put it back to use rather than just uh, filling up the dump or, or turning it back into, into uh, basic uh, raw materials. That's way too energy offensive to have to melt everything down, as it were. Uh, you, if you build yourself a motor, you should, be, you should have some mind to taking that motor eventually out of the product it was in and putting it into another product as a motor as opposed to melting it down to steel and putting and building it into something else <coughs> okay well anybody wants to follow up on this kind of thing as i said this is the green angle 
on, uh, on uh, the whole business of automation. And not just printers, but printers where it's exceptionally obvious. Uh, where there are a lot of electromechanical devices that can be recovered from the average printer, which would cost a lot of money if you went out to buy them for a project. But you can have them for nothing because somebody dumped a printer on the street. Okay. That's done. Uh, um, okay, that's a little bit more about the history. There's a whole heck of a lot more. If anybody wants another presentation, we can go through the rest of it. But I'll post it if anybody wants it. Um, there's just so much in this because, as I said, the, the whole concept of standardization is the thrust of, it, of, of industry throughout the, uh, throughout the history has been to standardize and automate and, and make things better, faster, cheaper, as it were. Um, and printers are where the rubber hits the road, sort of, where you actually get the chance to see on a daily basis something that does that, you know, that, that serves in a standard way and does that job right in front of you. So that's why I always took an interest in it. Okay, that's about it. Uh, so I think what we'll do is...